Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone's over my shoulder somewhere behind those cars. She'll be out in a second. How you doing? I hope you're happy and healthy doing the things you love with the people that you love doing them with. Please do me a favor, guys, like you always do, only if you enjoy the content, though. Smash the like button for me on the video. Hit the subscribe on the channel, if you haven't already. We're nearly at 19K, 20K is around the corner. It's all very exciting. Please help me out to get there. Really appreciate your support. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on today's topic. Also, guys, we are back with Shameless Football. We had a couple of weeks off because of various different reasons, but we're back. The link is in the description. Would love it if you could go over there and support the second channel that Henry and I are trying to build that's talking about you know, broader football stuff. Um, here's the news of the day, guys. We signed Johan Lange. Aston Villa, director of football, chief technical officer, Johan Lange, Big Lange. I'm loving Big Lange instead. Well, I'm not loving Big Lange instead of Paratici because I don't necessarily see what's going on here. And I'll tell you why in a second. Let's just get through the kind of formalities. Big Lange, Johan Lange is, uh, he's been at Aston Villa since 2020. 10 years prior to that, he was working in Copenhagen. I think he had a short stint as an assistant manager, I think at West Brom. Could be wrong about that. But in a nutshell, he is tasked with doing the role of a director of football staff at Aston Villa and has done very well. He's generally acknowledged and given the accolades for rebuilding, revisioning, re envisioning Aston Villa's uh, rebuild. Lots of reason there. Um, Aston Villa were relegated and they came back up in 2018, 2019, I think the season was. Since then, in the four years that have gone past, they finished, I think it was 17th, 12th, 15th, and then 7th or 8th last year. Um, so a bit of a kind of stepping stone process, but they've got there in the end. And um, they are looking good. They've built a really good unit there, a really good outfit. Lots of really talented players, and Johan Lange is apparently the guy who is responsible for identifying the various technical attributes. He is a data scientist, or at least someone who claims to be at the top end of the spectrum of directors of footballs in terms of understanding that side of the game. And that obviously is a benefit, something that will behoove us um, in the future, because that is something we've already identified and spoken about that Tottenham are looking to go down that path with which is interesting. In terms of the major players that he's been involved in signing at Aston Villa, well, you have, of course, Mr. Ollie Watkins, who's been their talisman now for a couple of years. Fantastic pinch from a lower division uh, club. Was it Hull? I can't remember who they signed him from, to be honest. I forget, forgive me. They also got Matty Cash, Poland international. They have Buendia. Uh, he signed Buendia, amazing player, long-term injury at the moment, I believe. Um, attacking midfielder on the left-hand side, fantastic talent, and they miss him. But they're not, they're not missing him too badly with the way that they started. Uh, they, they also signed Emmy Martinez through him, World Cup winning goalkeeper. I really like Emmy Martinez, I think he's a really, really good goalkeeper. He's also somebody that when I was using Scout, he came up all the time when you were filtering by the kind of key attributes and assets of players that would suit the system. Martinez was one that came up, and so I was more than happy when we were linked with him. It didn't work out anyway. They've also got, gone and signed Bubakar Kamara as well from uh, during during that time. They're the top sort of top five biggest name signings that have worked out for uh, for Johan Lange. They don't spend massive amounts of money all the time, but in the last couple of years, they have had really good backing from their their owners and that obviously makes things a little bit easier but look he's coming to Tottenham and I'm going to immediately kind of extinguish any ideas that we can go back to Villa and and take some of their some of the signings that he was responsible for to Tottenham players like Ollie Watkins despite the fact that Ollie Watkins would really suit Tottenham and we are looking for a number nine and he's probably the best striker in the Premier League outside of the top six you could not make an argument saying he's probably top three or four strikers anyway and um, he would be brilliant at Tottenham, and that's the sort of player we need. You know, Ivan Tony is another one that we've been linked with, but he is probably more likely to go to Arsenal. Chelsea and Arsenal are linked with him in January, and I think he's already expressed an interest in Arsenal, so probably unlikely that we'll get him. So we have to keep the search going for a striker, but that's not for this conversation. This conversation is about the 
the rationale for Johan Lange. And what I would say is, you know, it's not the same as like managers that are leaving a club, going somewhere else, and then going back to their old club to take their most favourite players who have great relationships with the manager. That stuff is commonly found. Don't think it's as common to see directors of football going back to clubs. Maybe it does happen sometimes, but not all the time. Johan Lange has worked with Monchi from Seville, who's now at Aston Villa as the chief guy. Um, and look, that guy's crazy, Monchi. So to have worked with him and got juice from the squeeze, hopefully he will have learned some of the good sides of Monchi's game. And the fact that he can handle a little bit of like insanity probably means that he's a good convivial, a convivial, convivial, amiable person who can get on with people and figure out a way to make things work, which is a good sign. What I do find interesting, though, guys, is that according to Paul O'Keefe, Paratici is still going to maintain his position as a consultant for the club. And that, to me, leaves me with a bit of an uneasy feeling. Personally, I would have liked to have just kept it the way it was with Paratici in the consultancy mode. And then when the ban, in whatever format it still exists, is fully baked in and completely, you know... Um, finished, fulfilled, then he could have come back into the club and there would have been no hard feelings and everyone can shake hands and get back on with the job. Because I feel like he is building something, he has built something of which, the fruits of which are now starting to ripen and I think that that is a shame as I said before when I was talking about the previous director of football we were linked with on a couple of videos ago, if someone comes in and wants to stamp their authority, have their kind of, have their mark over the, over the system, then you could end up going from pillar to post and square pegs will eventually be pushed into round holes and it's always going to be a disaster. If you can gently nudge and readjust and recalibrate that way, then you can obviously get the benefits of new people without having to restructure the entire system. With Paratici still being here and this new guy coming in, I don't know if that's too many cooks spoil the broth. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians, to pardon an old, an old phrase. I just don't know if that is a recipe for disaster where you're going to have too many big personalities that are going to want to do it their way like we were getting on fine with just Daniel Levy and Paratici a year ago and then all of a sudden now we've gone from that to adding two more names into the hat in Scott Munn and Johan Lange and they're all going to have big personalities they're all going to want to have their own say we know that Daniel Levy is probably unlikely to really take his hands off of the reins like this Scott Munn role is intended to see happen and maybe just maybe let's not forget maybe just maybe Daniel Levy his relationship with Paratici is good maybe he said he wants Paratici to remain in a consultancy mode I'm speculating here and I don't want to you know make out this is fact I'm just you know just spitballing with you but I just find it weird if you why would Scott Munn need Paratici if he's got Johan Lange if, pa if Paratici, according to Paul O'Keefe, is staying on in a consultancy mode, then, and all, the Athletic also said this last week as well, then, to me, you don't need both. And they're going to have their own ideas. And Scott Munn's going to have his own ideas. And that probably looked like Johan Lange was his idea. But maybe Daniel Levy has said, well, I'm taking my feet off the pedal on this one. I'm going to hand over to you, Scott. But the last thing I'll say is, I want you to keep Paratici. And if he's doing that, does that already create some sort of disharmony some sort of like well you're not really backing me I'm really you know you've, all, you've always got one hand on the on the steering wheel as well uh, as well like a backseat passenger like for me or what's it called a rear backseat driver rather um, I don't know it just feels a little bit odd but the benefits are we're going to get someone in who has got a good track record he's been successful where he's gone and he's he's kicked Aston Villa into the, the new version of themselves which does look very dangerous he also apparently has a really strong grip and handle of the data science stuff that goes into scouting which is going to be really interesting and I think an integral part of what we're doing I mentioned before guys remember I mentioned before right that our revenues are about 450 million quid at the moment 440 I think it was last season which was near record and we spend about 50% of our revenue on wages and then we spend about 120 million quid a year net every year for the last six years on average on transfers, which when you aggregate them all up, it comes to about 75%. 
and you're getting to the point in a year's time where you need to be below that 70% threshold absent injections of capital from owners. And our owners aren't doing that anymore. They said they want to make it sustainable. Where's that, that last 50 million quid gone, by the way? We haven't seen anything about that for, for a long time. And they promised that was coming in in January. Anyway, but besides the point. So if Tottenham are only spending 120 million pound a year net and are with the inclusion of your salaries already bumping up against what you can do with FFP on a net net basis. It's more complicated than that. You can push money around, you know, you can create accounting practices that can, you know, have some of that money come onto your books now and less later and all those things that Chelsea do to be able to get around FFP, but in a simplistic fashion even though we're creating all these revenue streams, the fact that we do not have a very good track record with our transfers and we spend all this money but we never recoup any of it back on player trading player sales then we end up with being a really big team that can't really spend that much more than we're really spending every year because we're just not getting the kind of net net back on transfers and so one of the mechanisms in which we have to improve on is finding ways to make money from player trading to get that balance back and that in no small part is why I think we're pushing towards youth development because inflation in football for bang average players now costs you, you know, 40, 50 million pound gets you a good player, but not a great one anymore. Look at Brennan Johnson, look at uh, Livramento, look at Kai Havertz and Mason Mount. The amount of money that you're spending for those sorts of players that they're not world-class players and 60, 70 million pound used to get you a world-class player. It doesn't anymore. And so the inflation in the transfer market is going far, is growing far higher than the inflation in your ability to grow revenues, even though we're being clever with Beyonce and the NFL and all that stuff. So the answer really is to find additional revenues. The, the one area of revenue generation that Tottenham are really bad at is player trading. And so part of, I think, the rationale and the value prop of someone like Johan Lange and Paratici, and maybe they can work together on this fashion, is to use the data to identify the young talent that's coming through and to pick them up for pennies in the pound now and don't always need them to come through to the first team but use this brilliant youth system that we've currently got apparently to be able to fund future transfers for the first team if they're not good enough for us but they're good enough for somewhere else and we make net net money back and one example of that guys that I think we're going for right now is Norwich City goalkeeper Dylan Thompson who allegedly has turned down a new contract at Norwich and apparently is someone who's really, really highly rated and he's coming to Tottenham. So once again, Tottenham are identifying these young players like Ash Phillips, like Valiz, whatever. We might be paying some money. We'll be paying compensation to Norwich. But look, I mean, well, we've got Hugo Lloris leaving the club. Fraser Foster's getting on. We do have three other goalkeepers at the club that are going to either make it or either not. I think two of them probably have had enough time and haven't really kicked on. But as long as we keep that kind of turnover of young talent and the best young talent coming through, then that is another way that we can hopefully find more revenues and use the revenues we gain from some of these player training sales to go and finance and, 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 um, and further purchase the future filling of holes that we have in the squad. And we're always going to have something we need to fill in the first team. And sometimes the youth team isn't going to be able to provide us with the solution. So it's interesting. And Johan Lange will be able to use his skill set around data analytics to be able to help in that regard. But for me, my last thing I'll say is I just find it odd that you would have two directors of football and a chief footballing officer, which is in, for all intents and purposes what we're doing when for the previous years we haven't needed a chief football officer and we haven't needed we barely needed Paratici only on a consultancy role and suddenly we're now kind of adding too many people in there I don't know it's going to be interesting but for me I always worry I've been in organizations at that kind of higher level where I've seen new faces come in and everyone's got an ego everyone's got their own version of what they think is the best path forward and usually personalities will clash I'm not saying that will happen here I don't even want to like put it out there in the you know the ether. I don't want to manifest it, but I'm just speaking from my speculative heart that it's a bit of a concern. But anyway, we'll find out. Johan Lange, are you in or are you out? Big Lange and Big Ange. What else do we need? You let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, bye bye.